thank you. Uh, so I think we can get started. Okay. So uh, uh, you know, I'll talk about uh, you know some of the work that I've been doing for now. About you know, I mean, I, I started this line of work when I joined Rice, and um, um, it has been like um, getting more and more exciting since then. Uh, so this is joint work with a whole bunch of PhD students and also some uh, smart undergraduates at Rice that I was fortunate to work with. Um, uh, this doesn't. Okay, so I'll just use the pointer. I'm just going to unpin your video, so it's not coming across. Pardon me? I'm just going to unpin your video, so uh, it's not coming across. Oh, okay. Or it will be up here. Will that be good? That's fine. I mean, yeah. All right, so, uh, you know, this is a, this is a, a plot that we, uh, you know, like was uh, taken from a course by Andrew Ng, and it pretty much summarizes what we see in uh, real world, especially in industry. On the x-axis, you have amount of data. On the y-axis is performance, right? So as you start giving more and more data, performance as an accuracy, you start improving the accuracy. But also, at the same time, you have to keep increasing you know, the, the size of the model. So you know, larger models get you better accuracy. Smaller models, not so much. And as you keep increasing, you can go higher. And most of the applications care about how high can, we can go. So for example, if you're looking at Alexa, or you know, text to speech, uh, you know, kind of application. There is certain threshold beyond which things starts to make sense and applications become, uh, you know, really usable. So industry care about going as high as they can, and no wonder we are seeing, you know, like more and more data and bigger and bigger models. So if you just go over, uh, you know, this this was a paper by Google in 2017, and the paper was titled "Outrageously Large Neural Networks," and Things to note, they were training 137 billion parameter model on a data set which has about 100 billion words. And the, this statement was in the abstract, is that large model capacity is critical for absorbing the vast quantity of knowledge available in the training corpora. And in the same statement, they said that this is not the biggest of our data set. We have a data set with a trillion word corpus, and we would, it is our goal and ambition to train a trillion parameter model on a trillion word corpus. So this was the paper, and it kind of summarizes what was going on. As in, like, as I increase the size of the data, I need, I mean, so 100 billion words, about 100 billion parameter, a trillion words, about a trillion parameter, right? And in fact, if you look at the progression from 2017, last to last year, we have seen, uh, last year we saw G shard, which was 600 billion parameter by Google, GPT-3 was 175 billion parameter. Everybody knows about GPT-3. Last to last year, just a year before that, it was GPT-2 with about 1.5 billion parameter. This year, finally, Google released a paper saying that they achieved that trillion parameter model on a trillion word corpus. So it takes Google about four years to come here. And again, like around the same time this year, there was a, you know, like Facebook came out and say, well, NLP, good luck. Look at recommendation systems. We need about 12 trillion parameter model. It was some sort of a you know, recommendation model that they were training. And if you're, if you're thinking about what is going on, do we even need that many parameters? Well, that's an interesting question. We may not need that many parameters, but we need a lot. And the argument is very basic information theory. So imagine I have a data set, and I'm like trying to do question answering. So at the end of the day, ignore everything. I'm learning a function from the data that when you input a question gives me an answer. So that function itself can map a question to an answer, and it knows all the variability that you can ask in a question, and all the variability that should be there in a good answer. What does that mean? That this function, from a basic information theory perspective, knows all the variations cannot be small. The bits that the function occupy cannot be small. Basic information theory, and that is what we are observing. The more bigger model data set we go, the bigger ambitious tasks we see, we see bigger and bigger models are coming in picture. Now, there is another trend that is going on, and basically, I will say is the simplification of the architectures. So, I mean, I don't know whether you're familiar, there were like quite a time where recurrent neural networks and LSTMs were quite popular, and now we don't see them anymore because there was a paper in 2017 that say attention is all you need. Obviously, it's, you know, like it's not all you need, but attention was able to replace recurrence and LSTMs. And, you know, and most of the recent models don't use RNNs and LSTMs. In fact, they've figured out whatever accuracy you can reach with those, you can as well get with attention. 
then even starting last year the question about attentions and uh, you know like convolutions are also in questions because now there are papers that are arguing that you can even treat images like words as in patches of images like words and then do uh, you know equally good in fact there was a 2020 paper by google as an image is worth 16 cross 16 words and transformers for image recognition in fact we here work with zhao zhao uh, and we showed a, you know like that we could surpass convolution and get pretty good accuracy in seismic processing and seismic inversion just using something like a language model. And in fact, now the attention, so these two were talking about like, well, you can replace everything with attention, but now recently even attention is being replaced by fully connected models. So more or less there was a synthesizer paper that says that, well, maybe you don't really need exactly the way attentions are, but something much simpler will work. And in fact, uh, you know, I also had a chance to work on this where we looked at an architecture which is pretty much like embedding models and if you take pairwise embedding models then you can actually get the same result that attention takes. In fact, if you're wondering what are the most recommendation models, they are more or less just fully connected which, uh, you know, including Facebook's DLRM, Amazon DSSMs and these are some of the, you know, most used models in recommendation systems. So models are getting bigger and we are also realizing that bigger but simpler are also fine. And, you know, like as the models go bigger, the, you know, the, the data goes big, you know, the, you know, this is what I think is, you know, is driving the AI innovation you call is the capability of an organization or, or, or a team to evaluate an, a lot of hypotheses is actually driving the AI innovation. So I want to, let's say, solve ImageNet and I can hypothesize 20 deep learning models and test them pretty quickly. I will be faster than others who will take way more time to evaluate those models. And that is why we see like companies like Google, Facebook, they are leading because they have significant computing resources from, from model hypothesization to validation, it takes them less time. And you know, this is, this is you know, who is winning the race, the one with the most extensive computing resources. Um, and the reality of AI is this, I mean, again, like, this is pretty much even the best teams in the industry, the team with like, you know, the most extensive set of AI engineers, even they go through this cycle, they start with a model, then they will evaluate it, refine the model, evaluate, evaluate until you reach an accuracy. So that's the reality, you have to engineer every model. There is no application more or less out there which in which you will see that somebody will take off the shelf model and then it goes in production. The day a problem is hypothesized to the way when model goes in production, it takes a numerous cycle of, uh, you know, trial and error. Now, a lot of, you know, inference efficiency is also a, a critical in, uh, you know, model deployment. So for example, if you're deploying the model, you're running this neural network multiple times. That takes a lot of effort. And if you look at the research that is going on and how to make inference efficient, it's pretty much about searching the most efficient model which gives you the good accuracy. An efficient model could be sparse, could be low bit, could be something else. And how do you reach to that model? By searching. So again, you train a lot of models, a lot of models which are supposedly cheap, and you pick the cheapest model and that reaches a good accuracy. So, it, so this is also like training in, in, in some sense is driving how fast you can do inference. What I mean by that is the faster you can train models, the more models you can train and evaluate, the faster you will find a model which is cheap even for inference. Uh, and again, like as I've mentioned, how do any search happens in any team? It's basically what they call a graduate student descent. Generally, you have like a whole bunch of PhDs who are refining, fine tuning model based on their expertise because there is no, uh, you know, st there is no well-known way of how do we search, right? It's even worse than random search. So it's better to get some intuition of a person who has worked in the field for a while and use that intuition-based guided search to reach a model which reaches a particular accuracy. And as we have seen that the training time drives everything. So there is a significant attention on how do we decrease the training time and therefore we see the rise of specialized hardwares like GPUs, TPUs, which can, which, which can do uh, training, which is more or less a matrix multiplication 
a, a sequence of matrix multiplication much faster than what the hardware that we are used to, which is CPUs. And uh, no wonder we are uh, seeing a surge in demand for GPUs and TPUs because they can use a lot of parallelism to make model training faster. Now here is another trend that is coming up. So we are training a lot of models, much bigger models. But this is, a, this is a chart that came from MIT Technology Review and it talks about the carbon footprint of different things. And the first one is a round trip flight from New York to San Francisco, about 2000. Then human life is 11,000. American life, 36,000. A US car in the full lifetime, so you buy a car until it went into a, you know, like a, uh, until you trash it, it's 126,000. And if you train a transformer model with neural architecture search, pretty much something that most of the industries are doing on a regular basis, that takes 5x more than this. So imagine taking five cars, running them for their whole lifetime, and throwing them away. That's the amount of carbon footprint of an NLP training with model search. And that is happening on a regular basis. So clearly, you know, if you look at the trends, Compute power for advancing AI is doubling every three and a half month, which is good because we are computing a lot, but that's also the rate at which we are burning more energy, right? We are still stuck with an N-cube algorithm. So if you look at the best algorithm out there is backpropagation, bunch of dense matrix multiplication. Why we are stuck with that? It's really simple. And we are throwing a lot of hardware at it to, to, to make it faster because we want to reach the right model faster. And I mean, if you look at the economics, most of the companies are already spending. For example, if you look at the Alex uh, slide, he mentioned about training large model, tens of millions of dollars. So they are already spending tens of millions of dollars and the benefits are in billions. So that's okay. But if the growth is exponential, if we are needing exponentially large model, soon we will be spending more than what the benefits would be. And if increasing the model size is our only way to improve AI, well, it will go stagnant. So here is, uh, you know, what I have been uh, thinking about for a while is that, you know, what we are doing is we are going into an era of specialized computing hardwares and chips. We have realized that, well, it's a very significantly heavy workload. We want to make it faster. There is a dire need because that, that translates into a whole bunch of applications working. So we are putting significant investment in GPUs that are about 3x costly. Now GPUs are not just the hardware. They are actually a device that, that are usually vendor optimized, proprietary drivers. So you have to, you know, like throw away decades of expertise to talk with them. So you have, you know, you have developed a decade of expertise in your data center on CPUs. Now you cannot use that anymore because they don't talk well with GPUs. So you are actually changing the whole hardware software stack. They are hard to virtualize. And even the best GPUs right now have only 48 gigs or 40 gigs of RAM. There are many applications that doesn't run in that. So we are thinking to go to distributed. And as we have seen in the previous talk, distributed AI ML is another nightmare. And obviously, if you look at the energy number, I don't think it's a sustainable solution for future demands. And what we are not doing is we are not adopting, we are not rethinking how we train neural network, right? We know that brain is very efficient. Right, we are, but we are still stuck. If you look at the best system out there, even though the systems are evolving, they are still using the same backpropagation algorithm which was developed in 80s when computation was not an issue. And there is a reason for it. I mean, most of the algorithms that we develop are too sophisticated to be implemented on the hardware and we cannot see good benefits from them. And the algorithm that we are used to is really simple. What is backpropagation? A sequence of matrix multiplication forward pass, a sequence of matrix multiplication backward pass. What can be simpler than that? And so we are actually used to that simplicity and all the implementation are using it. And these days a machine learning person, for, for, for a machine learning person, if you don't give him TensorFlow or PyTorch, there is no machine learning. So we are so much used to those frameworks which are using these kind of algorithms that we don't see a world out there without them. But obviously, I mean, I think there is a real scarcity of people who understand both AI and efficient computer system design. And I think there is a need of it. And, you know, this is what I'm trying to hope to convince you that there is a very, you know, like rewarding area of research here. And if we can do something there, that would be very beneficial. 
Now, opportunities of AI training on CPU. So obviously, GPUs are uh, you know GPUs are you know getting better, and we are seeing a great performances from GPU. There is a whole workforce of people trying to optimize AI and GPU. But if we could train AI on CPUs efficiently, I mean, I think that it's going to be very useful because CPUs are very available. I mean, look at look at 70 or 80 percent of the computing hardware is act, are actually CPUs. A lot of them are sitting idle. Like if you look at the statistics of how many at any point of time CPUs are idle, about 75 percent of CPU cores are available at any point of time. Fully virtualized and customizable. So if you look at the solutions, like people have built developing a lot of software stacks, they know how to talk with CPUs. It's they are not vendor optimized. You can talk with the hardware directly. Customize it, you know, the you know, like security, safety. And the another thing is IoT and AI training. Currently, all the IoT believes that AI training happens on the cloud and it's the deployment that we should worry about. But imagine if I can enable deep learning on CPUs, and I'm talking about CPUs with let's say four cores and a small amount of memory. If we can do AI training in a resources like that, then we are enabling a possibility of AI training on the edge. And given the recent privacy issue, I think it can change the complete economics of how a, uh, IoT training looks like. Now with that, I will go a little bit about like what we are doing and what, what the hope is, and I'll show you some of the you know, like advances that we have made. So with this, there was a 2016 New York Times article that says that, well, the hardware acceleration, and that was talking about the ends of Moore law, Moore's law, and they are saying that, well, we are not getting hardware to perform or scale as fast as we used to. And the, you know, like the, you know, the next advancement will come from human creativity. And around the same time, there was uh, this uh, law after Moore's law, which is called Hung's law, after, uh, you know, the uh, NVIDIA CEO uh, Huang, Jensen Huang. And it claims that the synergy between hardware and software, and then software is coming more and more into the picture, is that we cannot purely rely on hardware to scale the AI, and it has to also have a significant software part. So with that, I'll, I'll start, delve a little bit into the technical details of backpropagation. We'll talk about why I see backpropagation to be wasteful and what are the opportunities and what we can do there, okay? So first of all, I mean, just I'm assuming people know what a backpropagation algorithm is, which is essentially I have a neural network, which is like a layer-wise model. So you give it an input feature, then every neuron is basically an inner product of the input with the weights. Then you get the value of the inner product. Then you threshold them at zero. So anything less than zero goes away. That's called ReLU. And anything bigger than zero survives and feed forward until you reach a prediction layer where you just, your final uh, layer tells you which class it is. So this is the kind of model that are getting more and more popular known as deep learning. And the way to train them is you take a batch of the data, feed forward them, compute errors, back pop, propagate, and do the gradient descent. Now, if you think about it, like, so a ReLU activation will compute the activations of all these neurons and will throw 50% of them. So you're already throwing away 50% of the computations because anything that is less than zero doesn't survive. So you do the calculation and you throw it away. So it's like, already 50% wasteful. In fact, there are a lot of research that was going on prior in NIPS 13, 2015, where people said that, well, you don't even have to throw 50%, you can actually throw away 90, 95%. And the way to do this is you take the input and just only take, let's say, selectively few neurons, which has high activation, and throw the rest. In fact, you can sample them in proportion to their activation, and you'll still be fine. Now, there claim was that this actually improves generalization because most of the parameters are updated only by a minuscule quantity and maybe that's noise. In fact, if you want to think about it, well, your networks are large, you have millions of parameters, you've been training this network for weeks, and today it made a mistake on an image of a cat. Do you want to go and train all the billions of parameters or millions of neurons based on one mistake? And if you look at the updates, most of them is going to be very small. In fact, they may not matter. Do you want to do that? And in fact, the argument was no, you should not because you should just pick like spike neurons or the neurons which are high in activation and only train them. The, the problem with that, the, the good thing that approach was that, well, it leads to generalization. So they in general gives even better accuracy. 
The problem is computationally it still doesn't solve the problem. Essentially you are doing the same thing. You are doing all the work of computing the activation and then throwing away most of it. In fact, 90% of that and then going forward. And because the puzzle remains the same, if the input changes, most likely these neurons that are going to spike will change. And I cannot know them in advance without looking at the input, right? So that, that was the question, can we still do it, right? I mean, so the question is given an input, can I somehow magically or approximately, uh, even approximately figure out some set of neurons with spike on this input without computing all the activations? Now this is uh, very similar to how we do web search. I mean, again, like, so think about it. When I type something for Google, let's say I type Rice University uh, Computer Science, right? I mean, if Google has not seen this, obviously there is caching going on, but that doesn't happen all the time. But if Google has not cached, Google doesn't take my query and then com compare it with trillions of pages out there and then give me the right result. Google has so-called indexed the web Right, and this is where I'm going a little bit into data structures in computer science. Google has indexed the web such that when I get a query, the query magically knows where most of the pages relevant to it are lying in the web and retrieves that. And this is essentially computer science 101. Even though no matter how big my data set is, somehow fetching from a memory location is a constant time operation. So the, the notion of pointers, if you don't have pointers, there is no data structures, there is no uh, trees, there are no linked lists, right? I mean, trees, when you are given a node, you assume that finding its child node is a constant time operation because given a node, I can just go to its child node because it's connected. How is it connected? It's connected by a pointer. So this is like, this is the fact, and I think still magical that somehow, even in my brain, when I try to remember something, I don't have to scan all my past memories to figure out where I have seen this person. It just pops to my mind in exactly the same way even in computers when I ask the question, what is located at this memory location? It's a constant time operation. And that is essentially what happens with the web. The web is indexed as in they reorganize web pages into a memory such that when you get the query, the query automatically lands at a memory location where relevant web pages lie. And then there is a whole science of how we develop that. But if it can happen on web, we can even do it here. So essentially, imagine if my network is as big as millions of parameters or billions of parameter, then can I reorganize my neural network into efficient data structures or reorganize them in memory such that when I look at the input, it goes to a memory location where likely spike neurons are located. That is what we are going to do. So this is how, you know, at a high level, this is how the algorithm looks like. And I'm going to talk about hash tables. By the way, we have uh, two uh, sessions coming up later, which are going to talk about efficient search and efficient training, in which we will go a lot more details into how these hash functions work. But essentially what we have is, uh, let, let's imagine that I have this neural network, uh, and these are neurons. What I will do is, every neuron is nothing but a weight vector. So it's just an object. I will reorganize this neuron into memory locations, Similar to how I index the web. So I initialize the neural network and I initialize these re reorganization of random, let's say neurons are randomly initialized, so these are more or less random. Now what I will do is I'll start with an input and then I will use the same kind of a query process that we do at the web. I will query this data structures to find me relevant neurons. And just like web search, it will, what happens is it will compute a hash function or figure out where, which memory should I go and then there will be a memory lookup, and the memory lookup will tell me that I should look at neuron two and four, then I will only compute activations of neuron two and four. Remember, I am not even looking at activations of one and three. Now what I have is a sparse vector here, where these values are zero, and this is the values I calculated, and I go to the next level. Now, with this operation, I'm doing a hash computation, a memory lookup, and I'm getting a sparse snapshot of a neural network. I will feed forward only on this sparse snapshot and back propagate. Once I update these neurons, I will also update the hash tables. So, once, so let's say after this neuron two and four gets updated, three gets updated, and maybe four gets reorganized from memory location two to memory location three. So this is how the training process will look like. 
neurons get reorganized in memory as we train, as the weights update, and every time I'm querying these hash tables to give me the sparse snapshot of the neural network. And I will, I will like to argue that this is brain-like efficiency. As it, as it comes slightly closer to brain-like efficiency, so there is a concept in uh, you know, uh, neuroscience called sparse coding, in which uh, you know, the argument is when we try to memorize a pattern, the brain doesn't try to memorize a pattern with what is known as a dense coding, in which every neurons have some value and then there are you know, lows and highs. It, it does something like zeros and non-zeros. Right, so basically the memory, the, the, the cat are basically these set of spike neurons. That's how, you know, like, uh, you know, the brain memorizes. But obviously when I'm not looking at other neurons, I'm probably not spending the same amount of energy I spend here, right? So sparse coding is suspected to be the reason why brain is efficient. And with this hash table based analogy, I'm kind of achieving something similar. Right? I am not even touching the neurons that I'm not updating. So, so I think this is, uh, you know, this is uh, exciting in that way. And now one interesting observation is that we can parallelize gradient descent. So gradient descent is not parallel. If I'm, if I'm uh, you know, like uh, predicting an image of a cat and updating myself, I have to first update myself completely before I predict, let's say, an image of a beer because I need to make sure that the mistakes are after the updates, right? I have to compute the gradient. But imagine if these two images are looking at different spike neurons and updating different parameters, I can update them in parallel. So this is like, there is a theory called, or there is a whole theory about these kind of technique, it's called hog wild, where you can essentially train these algorithms, where you can do gradient descent in parallel if the overlap or the norm of the overlap is small. And in fact, you can show that it still converges and has all the nice properties. So this is, I mean, again, like I have only shown you a high level idea of how this might work. Obviously, you might be thinking hash tables, like, I mean, isn't matrix multiplication simple enough? You're talking about maintaining a hash table, updating it. Well, that's, that has been my, like, more or less last four or five years of work is that we have made hash tables efficient. We have shown that the hash tables are doing very simple sampling. Uh, with data parallel gradient descent, we can also utilize a lot of core. Uh, we can even work on reducing memory latency. So, I mean, again, like uh, sometimes I'm like working a lot on like the statistical aspect of things and sometimes on the, uh, the system aspects of it. But we, we also had an open source implementation of this in C++. Um, again, like, so this is also has been like a highlight of, you know, so I mean, typically, you know, the way, I mean, research happens in different way, right? Typically we start with the problem. I want to solve this problem and then that's what this is. I mean, I started with solving this problem of a neural network, and I ended up finding something which I called a gem in, you know, like in, in, in adaptive sampling. So essentially what I can, the most mathematical way of putting my work or what I have been able to achieve with data structures is bridging data structures and statistics. So for example, in statistics, we all know that if I have n weights, and sampling is the most fundamental problem in statistics, and if I have to sample uh, you know, like xi in proportion to wi, so I have w n weights and n elements, and I want to sample xi in proportion to wi. Uh, from a computational perspective, if I have to just get one sample, I have to first read the weights, so it's order n. But if you tell me what the weights are, I can create intervals, and then all the subsequent sampling is constant time. Right, so if you tell me what is the next sample, I just sample a random number, which interval it lies, I'll pick that element. So computationally, this region is efficient. Now, assume a slightly different variant of this, where now the weights are all changing. So at time t, I give you a new set of weights, and then I ask to sample in that proportion. Now here it seems that there is no hope, because I have to at least read the weights all the time to do the sampling. But what we have been able to show is that if you have a probabilistic data structures, as in a data structure where the query process is randomized, in many cases, if you just look at the distribution of what you are retrieving, you can actually do certain kind of sampling, more or less in this regime. So a constant time sampling if the weights change in certain fashion. And obviously the certain fashion is pretty weird. It's not Gaussian or it's not any nicely behaved statistical distribution that we know. It's like one minus one minus collision probability. So there is some fun math stuff there too. 
But okay, so uh, I mean, th those was the algorithm, right? I mean, again, it takes a while, but we were able to figure out ways to make things efficient, and we have done some implementations too. So uh, I mean, again, I was always so first when I published this paper, we're like, okay, can I show something uh, impressive with it? And I was fortunate to have a set of students, especially some of the undergraduates here at in, in the CS department at Rice, uh, that were able to code this stuff up. So we were able to like, I mean, so we. We, we took TensorFlow, the most optimized by Intel, as one of the baseline. Uh, and we have three processor, AMD, Intel, ARM, which is also your M1 chips. Then we also use the TensorFlow's most optimized implementation on NVIDIA A100, so using Tensor Cores, everything. And we want to see how fast we can go on training. And then we also have the implementation of the algorithm, which is through the company that uh, you know, I co-founded with uh, you know, uh, students and colleagues. Uh, we implemented that, we call it BOLT, as in big goal layer training. And uh, it, it is the algorithm that I just gave a, you know, like you an update about, and it was doing all the data parallelism implemented in C++. And we looked at two things. We are only worried about how fast can I reach a particular accuracy. And we obviously wanted a bigger neural network, because if the neural networks are very small, the overheads of hash tables and all doesn't, uh, doesn't, you know, doesn't you know, match. So we use like a small, we call it a small network, which is 200 million parameter model. If you want to compare roughly BERT large in industry is 345 million parameters. And then we also have a larger uh, recommendation model, which is 1.6 billion parameter model. And GPT-2 was about that size. And so we want to see how an implementation of the algorithm that I showed fare with the two best industry scale implementation, even on some of the hardwares. And here is uh, you know, like a snapshot. So the, uh, on this axis, we are looking at the time per epoch. The blue bars is actually 8, 14 seconds, 300 seconds, 644. These are on CPU using this implementation of the algorithm that we talked about. The orange line is actually tensor flows, as in like Google's implementation or the software's implementation on the same CPUs. And in reference, we have also put the best top of the line GPU, NVIDIA 800, and how much time it takes the uh, to train with TensorFlow. Now this is again like time per epoch, but you may be like, okay, how many epochs do you need to train? That's also not uh, you know clear. So on the on this here we show the accuracy climb of the recommendation model with the wall clock time. And again, note these two wall clock times are on the CPU. This one is on a GPU. So obviously GPU is much faster than CPU if you use TensorFlow. But if you use a smarter algorithm, things can completely change. Now this was on a 200 million parameter model. Things starts to become even more interesting when you go to a billion parameter model. A billion parameter model will not fit on your A100 GPUs. So if you have reasonable enough batch size, you need four A100 GPUs, and then you have to deal with the distributed uh, you know, communication and all. You can still train it. It takes about 1,600 seconds to, uh, per epoch. Whereas if you take an Intel, so this is actually a refurbished V3 Intel processor, which costs you less than 1,000 bucks. And if you use the usual TensorFlow, obviously it's very slow, but with our implementation, we are even faster than here. So this is actually pretty, pretty exciting. And uh, you know, like we have also compared it rigorously against like other heuristics like sampled softmax. So sampled softmax will actually, you know, if you do any other approximations, you will lose, uh, you lose accuracy. Now, if you use uh, you know, like, uh, the power, so well, the results that I showed was on commodity CPU. So these are like desktops with tens, twenties, of course. But if you use the modern CPU like the Intel's Copper Lake or uh, you know, Cooper Lake, which has like about hundreds of threads, then you can be about 15x faster than GPUs. And this time we compared with V100 because that's what we had access to at that time. Uh, so I'm just going to put the two things in perspective. On the one hand, we have the algorithm of the 80s, the back propagation, very simple matrix multiplication. I'm enabled to very much all the hardware support we have. However, it's expensive, can only scale with hardware, and energy considerations are bad. On the other hand, we have a different operation, which is a very hash table based. The good news is hash tables is very distributed system friendly. People know how to deal with hash tables. Uh, obviously, there are pros in terms of energy, as in I'm doing a lot less operation, like sparse coding. I'm not touching the neurons I don't need. Uh, there is a privacy angle to it, which we are working on it. Again, like you can show that things are differentially private because there is already a lot of randomness in it, and you can add small amount of noise in to make things differentially private. However, it is one cons that it's a random memory access, so you cannot really utilize the coalesce memory of what the 
uh, you know, GPUs and TPUs offer. And plus it requires a slightly more amount of memory. Um, you know, uh, talking about how we are making it uh, available to people, I mean, basically you can actually switch the engine from a TensorFlow engine to our Bolt engine using just two or three lines of code in Python. And, uh, and we are working on developing that. So, so that's also uh, pretty exciting. Uh, there, is a, there is a collaboration that is going on with Total that uh, we have uh, sparse activations and we can do similar things in convolution neural network. So uh, Mauricio and Dennis is here. We are working with them to, you know, like to make even things faster on, uh, you know, convolution neural networks. Uh, there is this uh, paper that is appearing, going to appear in the NeurIPS workshop this year. Uh, we have also looked into the inference piece of it. There is some more tricks that are needed to do inference while training. It's okay if you sample and even if you lose uh, accuracy, I mean, even if you do approximation, training is very much forgiving, but not the inference. Uh, and with that, I mean, again, like if you are more interested, come talk to us. We'll talk, we have a session in the afternoon that talks about more details on to what these algorithms are and how we can you know, use them. Uh, but essentially, I want to again like close this with a thought that we are still, even the best implementation out there is still using the same algorithm that was designed in 80s. And I think we can go further if we, if we rethink those algorithms instead of just rethinking the hardware and the hardware and the software stack. And uh, we also have uh, implementation and demonstration. Uh, one message is that it's not really hard to outperform the best AI implementation on really large network because you know that they are doing dense matrix multiplication. Most of that is not needed. And uh, here are some of the references. With that, I will stop here. Thank you very much. presentation. Thank you so much. Thanks again to um, Angela and Lydia and the organization team um, for such an amazing event and open to everyone. Uh, my name is Tani Zhang. I'm a marketing professor at the University of St. Thomas. I'm also the founding partner, uh, founding partner at ZLab Ventures. It's a venture studio and a fund investing in impact-driven software startups from scratch. So um, from the academic side, I really agree. I love how you combine the algorithm side with the uh, uh, computation efficiency. Uh, so my background is in psychology and marketing. So I wanted to say that there's actually a lot of supporting evidence from uh, uh, human cognition on uh, simple, heretic, <laughs> simple heuristics. If, uh, for example, there's a school of thought coming out of Max Planck Institute um, by a group of uh, cognitive psychologists. They really believe in the beauty of simple heuristics, which saves, you know, it's like how brain operates. Well, uh, essentially, we can actually make very accurate predictions with very info very little information without knowing. Um, anyways, I'm not gonna go there, but my concern is just like what you mentioned, it's very similar to the analogy of consensus versus sampling. And whenever we're using a sampling, you know, although it's efficient in terms of data collection, but there's always a bias, and I'm, I'm glad you also addressed the bias. So I guess my question is, you know, it, it's almost like how human brains um, operates. You know, we're usually lazy when, when we're when we're going with the efficient way, like you know, being stereotypical and all the prejudice usually happens like that. So I just wonder. Would that also happen when you decide who are, like which neurons are the ones that's gonna make it to the next round? And can we afford that potential bias? And of course, that you have a lot of measures to address those bias. My second question is what's the best way to reach you? Um, you know, and continue the discussion. Um, Th yeah, so. Thanks, thanks for the question. I mean, the, I will answer the second first because it's easier. You can reach me by, by email. So, you know, anchumali at rice.edu. Now answering the question about uh, you know, the bias, is there any bias in how we, what neurons get selected? Again, like, so I, I am not a you know, cognitive person. I mean, I have been now recently gotten more interested into it because of the relevance of the, what I'm doing and you know, the inspiration that you can draw from the efficiency of the brain. Uh, you know, the brain is uh, you know, like 1,000 times more efficient than where we are. 
right? And so right now what is happening here is essentially a sampling process. So every neuron has a chance. It's just that the spike neurons has more chance. So that also is one of the reasons why it regularizes and you can show that it's also why, you know, ideally when you have not trained, you don't really know which neurons are spike neurons because neuron starts randomly. So when everything is random, every neuron has a fair chance to be a spike neuron. But as things progress, depending on what neurons has acquired over time, their chance of becoming the spike neuron change. And obviously there could be a bias, again, like I mean, I, uh, we have not done anything yet to mitigate any kind of biases in this. We are purely focusing on computational issues. So, but that is, you know, something that would be very interesting to know more about and see if there are certain implications here. Too. I mean, so you will be surprised, the, 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 you know, one of the, you know, like uh, Turing Award winner, Jeff Hinton himself at some interview said, well, backpropagation is, is not how our brain works. And uh, in fact, there is a consensus among like even the best ones out there that the brain does way more efficient way, backpropagation. And again, like we are, we are not doing backpropagation, but still like more or less gradient descent because I think there is also this hole in the optimization that gradient descent kind of is the only more or less known technique that we have figured out. I mean, obviously there are few gems here and there like, you know, the eigenvalue problems and all. But other than that, we don't really know more about optimization. So it's still gradient descent, but again, like it's not like as uh, extensive as the backpropagation. But yeah, I mean, again, like questions about backpropagation, I'm not, I'm not the first one. People are like suspicious about it anyway. Well, no, it's, it, but it, it also talks, makes us Yeah, I mean, again, like, I mean, it's always fun to go to the drawing board. So this is what I teach in the class every time is like, I mean, if you want to get like 1.5x or something, you can take whatever is there and hammer the hell out of it and you will go 1.5x, 2x. But if you're talking 10x to go to the drawing board, So, I mean, yeah, I mean, again, like it's, it's a different uh, aspects of the problem that we are looking at. So one is obviously like, I mean, in the Alex talk, there was obviously like large model takes significant cost. So what I'm trying to go towards is like, well, can we reduce that cost and energy? And obviously we know the numbers are off the chart. What I think what Alex talk was about, you know, you know, can we, can we make like, can we not waste a lot of cycles that we do in making AI models work to a level where we want. Obviously, if you don't want to beyond that level, it's, it, it's going to be a different thing. Um, what made you, uh, you were not prepared AI, so that was fairly tricky. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, again, like uh, naming, by the way, naming, we have like very creative students in our groups. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, some of the, some, yeah, I mean, third AI is like, so first of all, it connotates with third I. And third eye in actually certain is a mythological thing in a certain, uh, you know, it, it means that a vision or perception beyond the ordinary. That's like, so that's there. Then there is a third wave of AI, right? We are in the third wave of AI. Third AI, third eye kind of connotated. And I, I, I don't think we did a very good job in thinking a lot, but we are, we are, we are happy with what, uh, what we got. Thank you. Thank you.